suburban life. So much is the same. Week after week. Who hasn't had the impulse to put their life on hold for a moment? Just vanish completely. My wife's first call would be to my office. No, he hasn't come in. No, he didn't say anything. Car still there. The plot thickens. How far am I willing to let this go? It's amazing that you're able to jam in like, there must be like 2,500 people in this <laughs> studio audience right now. Every corner, every nook, we can throw a person in, you know. <laughs> uh, guys, congratulations on this film. I, I loved it. I love what you did, and I love the, the bravery of doing a project like this. You really go out on a limb with it. So congratulations. It is, as uh, I, I guess Robin said, I, I described the, the movie once as a strange little story. It's a strange story. It is, and it's a very delicate story, too, because it doesn't have a protagonist that you go, oh, I like him, I think he's great, I'm, I want to root for him. It really challenges you, uh, much like another show that I did. That... <laughs> but I would say, unlike that other show, I mean, you, there aren't really other characters to sort of bounce this you know, uh, anti-hero off of. It's re you're really just stuck with the anti-hero here. I mean, that's, that's what I like. I like being with characters that I don't necessarily like. I really didn't like this guy, but I loved being with him and, and sort of suffering through his misanthropy and his uh, arrogance. Uh, <laughs> oh, you, you hey, charmer. And Brian, you were so good at that. Uh, Robin, talk to me, I, you know, uh, you've been working on this and trying to get it made for like, what, seven, eight years? Is that true? How did this start uh, for you? I, I read the short story in 2008, but I spent about four years trying to get this made, um, which is, I, I don't think that's that unusual for feature films. I think it's, it's always a long journey with feature films. And what was it about this short story that uh, you wanted to adapt? I mean, the fact that you were adapting something that was essentially mostly an internal monologue and, and a, a one-man show. I mean, yeah. you got the best for that, but, you know, what made you want to do that? I think there was something about that short story that appealed to my own secret perversity, actually. And <laughs> yeah, I, I hooked into it in some kind of way that I couldn't explain when I first read the story. That kind of eternal feeling of like, if I died, what would you guys do with yourselves? You know, how would yeah, you react? Yeah, exactly. It's that Tom Sawyer moment of attending your own funeral, kind of. Yeah. Except, uh, you know, it is. A, it's also an awakening story. There, I mean, there are a lot of different feelings in this this movie. But the scary thing really was I had to find the perfect actor. If Brian had not shown up, I mean seriously, what would this movie have been? Right. And Brian, when did you it show up? It would become a blockbuster. <laughs> <laughs> Someone might go see it, you know? Yes. <laughs> Brian, when did you show up in the process? Had the script been written and it was brought to you at that point? Yes, it was already written and uh, it was presented to me as a, as a possibility and I read it about three years ago. And it really resonated with me, but I put it aside uh, on purpose, is what I try to read initially from an objective viewpoint, as if I'm an audience, and I am, to just see how it affected me. Did it, did it resonate? Did it, 
make me think or feel a certain way. And then if I can't get it out of my head, that's a great sign, and I go back to it, which I did. And then we had discussions like, well, I don't, I don't know if I, I like this guy. He's a manipulator and he's a liar and he, he abandoned his family and, and these are very sensitive things to me. And then I realized, okay, I was a little too close to it. I, in, in order to play a character like that, you don't want to stand in judgment of your character. So I needed to let all that go and get down to a foundational understanding of the character, which is that he's a man in crisis and he simply becomes the, the simplest form of, an, of a human being, an animal, concerned mostly with shelter and food and clothing. I can't get more simple than that. And then he builds up again in a different way, in a different understanding. So it was, it was, it's quite a journey. Where do you think that crisis comes from? Because uh, I, I felt as if it came from sort of those aspects of his personality that you didn't like. And it's that moment that you reach in life where suddenly everything that's bad about you that you've always put into the back of your mind finally catches up to you. You know, the rest of the world goes, we got it. We're moving on, you know? Well, I think there is some of that. I mean, there, there are times in your life that you reflect and you look back and you're introspective on, on the way you lived your life and what you did. But I, think, I don't think there's anyone in this audience or anyone watching this that hasn't, at some point in your life, thought, I would just like to slow down. I would just like to stop this grind of this constant, I'm, you go to work, you come home, you go to work, you come home, you go to work, you come home. Is this the way my life is going to be forever? Is it just this, this hamster wheel of sameness? And if everybody here had an opportunity to just take your own snow day whenever you wanted to, you call your own like, I don't feel like it, and it's okay. And you could just push the pause button of your life and step out and read a book or go to the beach or do whatever you want. Well, that's what Howard Wakefield intended. His little personal pause was only for a couple hours. And a couple things happened that it prevent that from ending, and so it becomes a couple days, which may become a week, which may go longer and longer, and then it becomes this enormous issue now. It's no longer a little, oh, I just want to take some time for myself. That's right. It kind of becomes a project, in a way. It starts out one thing, and then at a certain point he realizes, you know, there's something here, and I don't think I can walk back in that door. I have to stay here until I figure this out. Well, he's a type A kind of guy, right? So it becomes a new obsession. His sort of, his life of manipulating and, have, and of obsessing, he's mainly gotten everything that he could want, you know, with the exception of maybe like a billion dollars or something like that. But he's gotten everything and now he doesn't have a new obsession or a new thing to be sort of the best at. And he's chosen this very odd <laughs> thing to finally do to become the best at. And I think there are occasions. It's like sometimes when you hit a, a major birthday, you, you, you stand in reflection of your life, don't you? Or, or an anniversary of some sort, you start to think about it. And perhaps Howard Wakefield hit a plateau of that. Well, I've accomplished this, this, and this. I got the girl, I, uh, I have kids, I have the house, I have everything I wanted. I'm, I'm a respected, accomplished lawyer making money. Is this all there is to life then? And I think it, 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 it is that kind of self-reflection that leads to uh, self-exile in a way right and he feels that there's something wrong I mean that's the, the it, it may be sort of competitive how can I beat myself but actually I think the truth is once he steps out he begins to feel like the life that he has been living somehow is not his own Robin, I, I feel like this it is a very original exploration of, of, of a story like this or these themes, but I feel like the, the story of the, the man who in, in midlife takes a, takes a moment and looks back and sort of decides what path to go on is something that we see a lot, but we don't often see women do this in films and in stories. And as a female writer-director, I'm wondering why you think that is, why it seems so often to be a man in crisis at the midlife point. Well, I think that, generally speaking, most dramatic movies do have a man at the center. It's very hard to get movies made that have female protagonists. So, so that's the first obstacle. And I think that the second one is that there's a lot of pink and blue coding in the world of Hollywood. So that there's certain kinds of material that I get offered and certain kinds of material that my husband gets offered, and they're very different from each other. 
So when you do something like this, which is independently financed, in which I wrote the, spec, the script on spec, I went to Yale Doctor and said, could I have permission to use your short story? Maybe we can make a movie out of it. I pulled together my producing team. We went after the cast that we wanted. You know, When you put it together yourself, there's no one that you have to ask permission of. You can just go make the thing that's on your mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if this had come out of a studio, then it would have been offered to a, a man to write and direct because they would have thought, well, it's a man's story, so obviously it has to go that route. And of course, that's not the case. What was the process like for you adapting it? Because so much of the film is uh, a quiet performance, but or I guess you could say a quiet performance. He's, a, he's alone, and it's an internal monologue. And I'll bring that to you in terms of how you shape that performance as well. But for you adapting that, what was that like? How often to use inter narration, internal monologue, and what you could show on screen versus tell through uh, narration? Right. Well, always, I, I love, what I love about the movies is that they're intensely visual. So that's always sort of my go-to first when I'm writing is, what am I seeing? Um, but in this case, of course, I had to focus on what am I hearing because he's a man alone. How are we going to know his thoughts unless we hear them? And so that, the, that question about the voiceover was something I worked with all the way through. And the nice thing about getting to direct it yourself is I didn't have to make every decision at the writing level. I could pile all the voiceover I wanted in there, knowing that in the editing room, I could leave stuff out if it was too much. And so we did. The last part of editing was shedding voiceover, particularly in the last half of the movie. So in terms of writing it, the challenges were mostly, how do I photograph the inner journey? I'd always been told that, screen, that novels are internal and screenplays are not. And yet I've always felt, watching movies, that if you leave room for performance, you will tell the internal story. And Brian, when you're on set and you have uh, all this narration, are you sort of reading the narration out loud while you're performing? Or are you reading it beforehand and just assuming that that's what he's thinking in, in this moment and trying to perform that externally? Well, Robin had a, a very unique idea of how to handle that. And that was to, before we started shooting, we laid down the narration entirely. During shooting, we laid down another version of the narration. What was the second version versus well, the it's first just, version? I think it was a sensibility that Robin had, and correct me if I'm wrong, but but my my approach might be different through the through the exercise of filming. And then we did it a third time at the end of filming when it was all done. And knowing what we had shot now, perhaps I would re I would phrase a, a, a line differently or or emphasize a word differently, or just give new meaning to it because I was there when we shot it. And yet, the first idea before we shot anything might also be an, an interesting way of delivering it. I thought it was very clever, and it was it was very helpful to be able to go through that journey again and feel three different feelings, you know, going through. Yeah. Robin, wait, why did you do that? That where did you come up with that idea to do it three different times? Hey, why don't so you back smart. off, okay? <laughs> Take it easy on the questions. <laughs> I don't know. It came out of my brain. Um, <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. You know, there's, a, there's something that I had observed, and I've been making movies since 1980. So, you know, I've seen how actors work, and I was in the theater before that. And I know that as you grow closer and closer to a role, that your understanding of the role expands and changes. And I really wanted to be able to capture that. I didn't know what we were going to get, but it didn't cost us very much to go find out. Did you find that recording the narration the first time before, perform before going on set and shooting the scenes, you think changed his performance a little bit in terms of how he was thinking about the scenes while shooting? I think just the hope? No, I think that that's a question, a really good question for Brian. I feel like definitely there was, you know, <laughs> you can address it to me, I'll speak for him. <laughs> Um, I feel like there were things that both of us learned in hearing it aloud. I think that that's one of the things that you get out of a, a live read, is that hearing it aloud, you begin to hear what's there, and you're, it's less of an internal thing, and you, it just lands in a different part of your sensibility. Well, it's so it's it, working um, on a stage play or, or in a screenplay when you're actually involved in the shooting of it is so ephemeral that when it's really working, you don't know the subtle changes, really. You, you allow your emotion just to, to lead you, and afterward you can reflect on it, but you don't necessarily, it was like, well, I don't know, it felt like it, that scene went so quickly, and, and it just, I experienced it as opposed to 
plotting it out. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, was, did you have any hesitation or fear jumping into this project considering the kind of performance you were going to have to get? Uh, no fear to it, just a, a hesitation though because of the, the uh, character traits that he, he possessed that were not very likable. And, um, and it's a delicate piece. And it, it, there are so many areas in which it could go wrong and spiral out into some strange you know, reflection of something that doesn't really tell a story and we don't see an advancement of character or plot or anything. So it, it, it was very delicate. I was more concerned with that. Um, but Is after it, talking with Robin about it and doing our rehearsals, um, I realized that we, we were on the same page, that we're going in the same direction. And it's, it's an experience. You just have to, it's a big trust exercise, both she to me and me to her, in order to carry us through that we know, we, as much as we can know, that we're heading in the direction of the story we want to tell. It's also one of those things where he's not the villain, so if you're playing unlikable, you can't really sort of chew into those things and make them very playful. You have to find a way to, to play them so they're totally realistic, but at the same time, he's still somewhat likable for the audience, or they want to sympathize with him. Well, I think that's perhaps the, the case. Is that I think you know what, what Robin was alluding to before about it's been coated with blue and pink, uh, it, it, I, trying to identify and, and compartmentalize this is what m boys and men are like, these are what women are like, and let's put them separate. Uh, so too is the idea of uh, protagonist and antagonist. As like We're thinking that the pr protagonist has to be a likable person. And the truth is, is that if he's honest, if he presents himself in a plausible way, that his actions are justifiable, and as long as audiences can understand him. They don't have to like him, but as long as they understand him and feel it's an honest portrayal, uh, they'll be with you. Well, you've always sort of been able to break that rule in terms of protagonists being unlikable. Walter White, for instance, I mean, as much as people loved him, he was in many ways a, a villain by the time you reached the, the end of the season. Did you feel like you had a background in being able to present a charismatic, somewhat likable villain? villain? I have a background in villainy. <laughs> <laughs> and even- I'm gonna we were... put that on my resume. <laughs> Even what we were talking about Already backstage. On your <laughs> Even backstage, we were talking about that your episode of the X Files, which is very, very similar. You know. Uh, I, yeah, I guess. I mean, I do. I am attracted. Um, I guess like a magnet uh, to complex characters. I I'm not really attracted to the simple. Oh, that's he's the nice guy. I did a soap opera in New York in the early '80s for two years, and my character was the nice guy. So everything I did was nice. My, I catch my girlfriend uh, having an affair on me, and I was playing the next scene upset, and they're going, oh, Brian, Brian, you're, you're the nice guy, remember, you're, you're very nice, so don't, don't be upset, <laughs> don't, don't be upset with your mother. It's like the brilliant directions of a soap opera, you're the nice guy. You're the nice guy, remember, don't be upset with your mother, it wasn't her, and I go, I know, but this is what people do. We take our pain out on other people, and then we have room to apologize. And you know, it's like, and it was a, it was a tough, tough thing to battle. But if you are able and fortunate enough in this business to attain some leverage, some notoriety, then you get to a point where you can say no to those simplistic, overly simplistic roles, and say yes to the complex ones and the ones that challenge you and, and scare you a little bit. You know, one of the things that I, I keep thinking about Wakefield, and I felt it so often in the editing room, is that Brian wasn't playing the unpleasant parts of this man. He was playing his vulnerability. In scene after scene, you see Brian laying himself bare in the most vulnerable way. As he does these things, they're not things that we might do, but they're things that we will feel. You know, so often when we talk about film, uh, film theoreticians talk about the male gaze, uh, because most films are made by, by men, I think a huge percentage of them. So women are, for the most part, viewed through the lens of heterosexual men. But this film is exploring the male gaze in many ways, but from a female director. What was, what was that like for you? How, how did, what were you thinking when you were doing that? Was that intentional on your part? Well, it was something I realized very early on as I was laying out the things that I wanted to include in the screenplay. And I thought, how can I approach this without 
actually making a film that alludes to the male gaze. This is the definition of the male gaze. A man sitting over here objectifying a woman and projecting his thoughts, desires, anxieties, frustrations, and so forth onto her. She doesn't get a chance to speak back. She is completely objectified. And so I didn't hold that as a thing of like, let's go after that male gaze. I just knew that that was one of the aspects. And without really intending to do that, do anything more specific, one of the things that my editor pointed out to me when we were cutting, he said, in the last third of this story, he is not objectifying her anymore. He is meeting her one-on-one, -on -one, and he is identifying with objects. And when I saw that that was true, we had, I had built that in without ever knowing about it. I think that it was just happening at a deep level. And I think so often his objectification of her in the beginning is still built off of this, these ways that men are taught to look at women, you know, or vice versa, but specifically we're talking about a man here, and he really views her only in, 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 in two ways, the, the mother of his children or the sort of uh, woman that he wants to be jealous of or because he considers her a whore in some capacity as a man. Right, there's this fear that he can't control her, and so I think some of there's a piece of that in the male gaze as well is that if you, if you make up your mind about that person, no evidence that they give you in return will change it, then somehow you have you've sealed that, you know, you, you have that, you've got that. So there is, but for him, I think that there's a, that, that sense that there's something wrong in the marriage that you see very early in the, in the film, as he begins to explore that, it does have something to do with the fact that she has agency. When, when she pushes back in the scene where we see, or early in the film, he kind of realizes, like, okay, I don't want to go there. And that, that recoiling is part of what sends him away in the first place. Uh, before I move on to audience questions, Brian, I have a silly question to ask you, and I apologize for this, but I love Seinfeld, and I loved your character on Seinfeld. And uh, he's kind of a villain, right? Wow, what is it with you and villains? <laughs> I think it's more enlightening about your personality. I'm the misanthrope and everybody's a villain to me. That's, That's what's exactly going on it. right now. And I was always curious, how much was defined about when, that, when you got that character? You got to do it in a few episodes of the show. And I felt like when I go back and watch that show after, having, after knowing who you are now, you bring a lot to that character. There's a lot of funny acting going on outside of the lines. And I'm wondering how much of that was brought to you in the script and how much of that was you just playing around and figuring it out? Uh, most of it was scripted. Almost all of it was scripted. The brilliance of, of Jerry Seinfeld and Larry David. Um, I, I only, the way they used guest stars in, in Seinfeld was that you, you're in there once to, to be the conduit to a story that the four main characters have. And so I just did the one, and they came up with another story, and they said, well, how do we justifiably, oh, we can get the dentist back to do such and such. And so that's how I came back for six episodes. Such and such being molesting Jerry. Molesting Jerry, <laughs> you know, giving Novocaine to, yeah. I mean, well, here's an example of one, one thing that happened. We were on the set once, and uh, it was that molesting Jerry uh, episode, and he didn't know if, I didn't know if I was talked or untalked. I didn't know. And he, uh, so I, uh, I'm supposed to get the laughing gas, so I asked the, the uh, dental hygienist for the nitrous oxide. She gives it, and I put it on him. He starts to go out, and I go, sweet dreams. And then he's, and he's wondering as he's going out. Well, we rehearsed that, and then the actors left, except me. I was on the set, and I was talking, I was trying to go over the, you know, just to feel the, the space to feel comfortable in what is my office and f handling the instruments and things like this. And I hear, hey, you know what would be funny? And I look around and up on a ladder is a guy adjusting a light. I go, excuse me? He goes, do you know what would be funny? I go, no, what, what would be funny? Said, said to a guy on a ladder, right. what would be funny? And he says, it would be funny if after you asked for the laughing gas, you took a hit of it yourself first. <laughs> I went, oh, my God. <laughs> that is funny. So I waited till we were taping. And then I said, uh, nurse, may I have the nicer socks on? And I go, yeah, that's good. <laughs> and Jerry falls over laughing. And we, he kept laughing as we kept doing that scene. And uh, Larry David kept chastising him. Jerry, Jerry, stop laughing. Jerry, 
Jerry, stop, stop it, stop it. Do it again, do it again, do it again. Stop laughing, stop laughing. It was, it was fun, but that's one in a, in a million. Uh, but it was fun, and you never know what, it was like going to comedy boot camp doing that show. Yeah. It was really I, I love that character. Thank you for indulging that. I love that character. Let's get some questions from the audience. What do we have here? Right here. Hi, Mr. Cranston. It's Hi. nice to finally meet you. Um, so my question is, you've done so many different characters in your career. Have there been any that you personally identified with? All the villains. All the villains. <laughs> Aside from the villains. Well, there was a Nini. there was a comedy a comedy I did last year called Why Him, that I I actually re related to. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I had so much fun doing that show, and I at first turned it down uh, a couple times because it was too close to me. Uh, a guy who's middle aged has a lovely wife and a family, and he doesn't like the, the guy that his daughter is dating. <laughs> it, it's, it's something that is like, oh, yeah? And so it was, it was so close that I thought, so how do That's I- That's normal, right? Yeah, so how do I do that? Do I, do I just show up? And, and in essence, yes. Yes, bring who I really was onto the set and play and have fun and make people laugh and think of funny things and enjoy your time. So that's, that's the closest that I've been. I thought Why Him was really a really funny film. I thought they did a great job. Uh, next question. Brian, pleasure yeah. to meet you. A uh, huge fan, by the way. Um, I just wanted to ask you, you've been in so many roles over your career, and I, I've seen you on TV and your movies and your shows. How have you evolved and, and how have you handled your evolution as an actor over the years to just take on each new role and really apply your skills. So and it seems like you've gotten better and better and better in each role. Um, so I'm really excited to see this movie and I just want to understand how your evolution has taken place as an actor over the years. Wow. Um, that's a really question. That's a good question. Uh, it means that I have to answer that I, I feel I've evolved in the world. <laughs> Let's just say that you have yes, I have. as a starting place. Let's okay. presume I have. Um, there, is, uh, there is something that happens to act. Are you an actor, by the way? I am not. Oh, there's something that happens to actors if you get very fortunate, and that is you, you gain some level of fame if you're very fortunate. It, as a byproduct of what I do, I've never expected it. I never really wanted it. I wanted to be a, a good working actor. I wanted to make my living as an actor. And that happened when I was 25 years old and ever since I've been making a living. And then all of a sudden, Malcolm, and then Breaking Bad, and then the play, I'm offered plays and movies and it's like, my wife and I look at each other like, what what oh my God, what's going on? And I'm excited about it. What it does, it gives, it, it, it introduces me to higher level of, of writing which is the most important thing that an actor can look for, is a better level of writing. When you get something like Wakefield that Robin wrote on such a sublime level that it's easier for actors to perform. The hardest work we've ever had to do is on poorly written material because there's no guidepost, there's nothing to hold on to. It doesn't track, it, it's confusing. So you have to work extra hard, whereas in, like in Wakefield, everything was hitting. Everything was coming in and it was like either my head or my heart and it was like, ooh. And it was either making me wonder or curious or uncomfortable or any of those honest emotions. And so you're collecting it and it's, it's a beautiful thing. So I think the evolution end of it is just to recognize or try to get good at recognizing a high level of material and if, if you attach yourself to that, more often than not, you will be successful. I think I have time for one more right here. Hey, it sounds like there's so much character development in Wakefield. And when you think about a, a character like Walter White, so different from beginning to end, I'm wondering, what is it like to play somebody at these various stages of, of such a huge change? And do you... Do you think about where it's all going and let that inform how you kind of play the beginning and middle, or do you try to keep that out of the process? That's another great question, really. Are you an actor? No, no, I'm no. Not. <laughs> sounds like well, this is New York. You're just like, like two really smart here, I think. So really, because it's very insightful and very, very emotional. Um, 
you, you know, as I said before, as I, I try to read material from an objective viewpoint at first, as if I'm just the audience, and to see and feel if it really resonates with me. Does it have an impact on me? Am I thinking about it? Am I conjuring ideas and thoughts? Do they come naturally when I, after I read that? Does it stay with me? And if, that, if it does, it's a good sign. Um, and then when I have, if I accept the role, then now I have the task of creating a character. And every time I start a character, it's outside of me. It's somewhere out there in the ether world. And it's only when I focus on going back to the text, going into rehearsals, questioning, daydreaming, using your imagination, using, using experiences from my past in my own real life, all these things and applying, putting it all together and you put it together and it's like, no, it's, it doesn't feel right yet. Then you take it apart and you put it together again. You know when you, you, when you work out, uh, you, you, you have to tear your muscles to build your muscles. You tear them, they recover. You tear them again, they recover. It's kind of the same way in building a character. You build it and you go, is this the best it could be? I don't, I don't know. Let me, let me dismantle this a little bit and see if I've built this from a really sound foundation. So it takes a tremendous amount of work. And that's my message to any actor out there listening. There is no shortcut for hard work. If you decide to, to have a career in the arts, you will be working constantly. But that's why I say you should only attempt to be a, a professional artist in the, in the performance art if you absolutely love it. It's got to have a burning desire. I'm in love with acting. So when I auditioned, when I get to go to work on Monday mornings, I'm very happy because I get to go to work. It's unlike a lot of people who are, Ugh, it's Monday, I have to go to work. Um, so I, I count my blessings. Brian, do you still audition? In a way, we always audition. <laughs> Brian. He's auditioning right I'm now. I'm auditioning right now. <laughs> um, I need, I need Brian Cranston to make a tape of this, please. No, no, and I'm listen, just not sure if he can do it. But I don't when, know. When Robin and I got together, and, and it was, she needed to find out if I was someone who was thinking along the same lines as her. There's the conversation. There's that, the conversation. Yeah. And in, in essence, if she didn't feel that, then she could politely try to pull back from that. <laughs> right? I mean, it's, it's That's true. That's right. It's a secret audition. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if, if I said, if I said, I see this guy just working out constantly in, in, in the attic. He's in the attic just working out, pumping, and doing steroids. Just a minute, I'm getting a call. Can I, I'll be right back. You don't have him pumping weights in any of these No, he's totally, Robin. totally doing that. That's what he's doing. So you have to hire a, a trainer. And I get a trainer up there, by the way. I have to have a trainer up there, a really hot chick in a bikini. That's the way I see it. You know, and it's like, So, I mean, in, even though it's not technically an audition, we're always, we, we always need to check. And quite honestly, I need to talk to her to see if she's open. Is she, because there are some directors who go, no, 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 I wrote and, say and, not but, or no, I want you to get up on this line, go to the window, and then put your hand up on that line, and do, and it's like, oh my God. There are people who have this so indelible in their minds that they can't live in a moment and, and share and see what happens that's a result of, of the rehearsal period. Yeah. Before I let you guys go, um, I'm going to be coy about the ending of the film, but people are probably going to watch this in VOD after they've seen the movie. So I'm just going to ask, do you, without giving away anything, uh, do you guys have any feelings about what happens when the movie is over to these characters? And did that help guide your performance? Were you thinking about that at all while making the film? Did you have an idea as to what happens later? And, you know, were you thinking of that? So you want us to give an answer without giving an answer? Yeah. I would say we, the only way we can know what has happened is if we know what went on in the house. And since we're outside the house looking in, it's going to be as our answer to that would have to be as subjective as what Wakefield is doing from the attic. Very nice. Yes. <laughs> what what she said. What no, she uh, said. You know, I'm and with I, her. I went to a film festival and I was asked that question right off the bat, first thing, and I just took the microphone and I handed it to the audience, right. and they passed it down, and everybody said what they thought had happened, and there was no answer exactly alike. 
I, I guess I'm not looking for a conclusive idea for the film because I thought that was the appropriate con conclusion to the movie itself. I meant in terms of you being able to tell the story while you were telling the story, driving towards something. Did you have an idea that you were driving towards that went beyond that, just for the sake of how tonally how you were doing it, feeling it out? Well, I guess there's always a question of can I come home? That's a universal question. And so I think that we were driving toward a question. At least that's what I felt was writing and directing and in the editing room. You know, my three shots at, at trying to tell the story is uh, we're coming toward that idea of can I actually go home? Not for me. Uh, for, no, I don't mean to say that. Yes, that is. <laughs> no. Don't contradict me, Brian. <laughs> Big, nah, nah. <laughs> you got that wrong. Listen That's to me. true. No, for uh, for an actor, you you uh, you don't want to think beyond that. In fact, you want to be so much in the moment of your character that it's it's somewhat detrimental to think too far in advance. Uh, you can surmise what your character would. You know, uh, there was a scene. There's a scene where he actually gets bold enough to present himself before his wife and some really remarkable uh, reaction comes out of that. And it was not something that Howard Wakefield was able to project. So there's that, we do our own projections. I wonder what it'll be like if I said this to her when I see her or whatever. But too far down the road, no. I think he was just, uh, he's hoping that he will be accepted. He will ho he's hoping that he will be loved. Absolutely. Guys, uh, it's, when can people see the film? It's, it's incredible. They have to go see it. Well, it, op it opens tonight here in New York City, and next week it opens in Los Angeles and about 12 other cities, and the following week another 12 cities, and it will be available on VOD. I'm not quite sure what the schedule is, but you next do. Next week, I think. Next it's, week? Is okay. it next week, VOD? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Guys, congratulations. It's a, a wonderful film, another incredible performance uh, by Brian. Wakefield, guys. Go see Wakefield. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>